Great. Good morning. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly, I thought there's no one around. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so today we're going to continue our study on the unfolding the covenant of God. <clears throat> Right, by way of uh, introduction, I'd like to tell you a little story regarding my, um, my encouraging all of you to read the Bible. <clears throat> I was from the Presbyterian Church, and we have moderators who serve, or they are like president or chairman. They serve two years, and then after that we have election, but a new one. So one of those, um, many years back, or not, there is a moderator, a chairman, who said, who, who tell the story about his father. Now his father was converted not very young, or quite elderly at the time, and um, he's illiterate, does not know Chinese at all. So when he was converted, he wanted to read the Bible. So some of you are older one, you all know like the three, five books right now. Three, five little booklet right now. It's just a little book, little booklet. And you're going to ask around all the words, the Chinese words that are in the Bible. Many years down the line, he learned how to read. He learned how to read the Bible, and he continued to read the Bible every day. <clears throat> so the two sons that he had saw him reading the Bible. They also read the Bible. And both of them become ministers in the Presbyterian Church. And both of them become moderators of the Presbyterian Church. Now you see the moral is that the children saw the father, father read the Bible. And they too read the Bible. And continuing down the generation, their children will be reading the Bible every day. <clears throat> Remember this man that didn't know Chinese law? and reads through the Bible, he learns how to read Chinese. <clears throat> well, my responsibility to all of you here in this English service is to help to grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of God. And your responsibility is also to read the Bible to study, but also to build this church. Remember, at the first meeting that we have, we sang building the people of power. Building a power, a people of power based on the word of God. So today, <clears throat> we are the fourth week of our English service. And um, I happily know all of you here. And um, you actually did fill a form way back before we started. But it is only a handful of you who actually fill it. So today, you're going to fill a form that give me more information in order to organize the English service. So there are many more things that we need to, um, to organize, for example, pray meeting, cell groups, right? Or is there a need because we hardly had 20 people in our Bible study uh, classes. Maybe we should be adding more. So those are the things that we are going to do. So we are going to enlarge our ten or rather organize this and let and build up this particular English service. <clears throat> so there will be a brochure going to be made in order to tell us what we are doing on a Sunday, that we are doing a covenant theology, and that this will be available to you to invite your friend. So you give the brochure to your friend or your flyer, and then you bring them on. This is your in your task or your responsibility in the camp in order to grow, to let people know that these are things that we are doing in our, our, <clears throat> our English service. And the next thing most important is the subject of, uh, or rather the theme, discernment. You know why discernment is so important? We're going to say a lot of things from the Bible. You must search the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word for it. You know, when I was a young Christian in England, 
I always tell my pastor, hey pastor, you, 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 you preach a very good sermon. He said, loud and flatter me. Go back and search the Bible. Read the Bible for yourself. Make sure that everything is safe and that it wins, that it is from the Bible. But if it is from the Bible, then you are obligated to keep the commandment of God. Right for this morning, <clears throat> we are unfolding the covenant of God from Genesis to Revelation. And today it is the covenant unfold to Abraham. So will you turn with me to the Bible? We will read a chapter on Abraham. Turn with me to chapter 12. So we all rise for the reading of God's word and then we will pray. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make you name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonor you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went, as the Lord has told him, and Lord went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarah his wife, and Lord his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they have acquired in Haran. And they set out to the land of Canaan, where they came to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Chechem, Chechem, to the oath of Moreb. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offering, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord and had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched them with Bethel on the west and I on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord, and Abraham journey on still, going towards Negev. Now there was famine in the land to Abraham, and so Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land, and he was about to enter Egypt. He said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a beautiful a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife. They will, then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So you are my sister, and that it may go well with, the, with me because of you, and that your life may be spared for your sake. When Abraham entered Egypt, he, the Egyptian saw that woman was very beautiful. And when the prince of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkey, male servants, female servants, female donkey, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah. Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why do you not tell me that she was your wife? Why do you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And the Pharaoh gave men order concerning him that they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Come, let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you again for this morning. A day of rest, Lord. Our Sabbath, in which, Lord, we are resting in you. Lord, we want to thank you that you have brought us together in this place. And, Lord, we want to pray and commit this time to your hand, especially the preaching of your word. 
Lord, we pray that for the Holy Spirit to help us to unpack what we have learned, what we're going to learn, Lord, in um, the covenant of God. And we pray, Lord, that um, you show us your word, write it into our heart, Lord, that we may not forget. For all this, we give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> right, we, we do a little of re recollection. And remember, the first sermon that we talked about was the eternal covenant. <clears throat> the eternal covenant in which we learned that, um, um, that the Bible talks very much about the everlasting covenant, the eternal covenant. But there is one verse in the book of Ephesians that tells us specifically this covenant is, but yet they did not mention covenant. Look at Ephesians chapter, four, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, the Bible teaches, and that we should be holy and blameless before him, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. No covenant there. But pastor, how could we th take this as a covenant? The will of God is actually God's covenant. He covenants to do something. And this is my will. The purpose of his will. It is like an agreement. For example, we, when uh, we should be writing our will before we die so that uh, people know that what we intend, what we want to do, uh, what will uh, you do all do when I die. So here, God said, this is the purpose of my will. This is what I covenant to do before the foundation of the world. So what did God do before the foundation of the world? He made an eternal covenant. He made his will. He should declare his purpose between the Trinity because there's nothing there at all. Before the foundation of the world, there were only God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The covenant to do all this is the purpose of his will and this is going to transpire right from Genesis right unto Revelation until we meet with God in heaven. But what did God do? Look at what he did. Or what he tells us that uh, in vision chapter 1 verse 4 to 5. He said he chose us before the foundation of the world. In other words, he said he chose you, you, before the foundation of the world. Again, we have another us there. He predestined us. He predestined you for the adoption of himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Notice what he said about us. He said he's going to adopt us as sons and daughters. God is going to take you as special people. God doesn't change mind. So therefore, before the foundation, this is his purpose. This is his promise. This is his will. So therefore, the Bible tells us, and it tells us clearly, in Ephesians chapter 1, it is according to the purpose of his will that he had chose you before the foundation of the world. So therefore, the eternal will, or the eternal purpose, or the eternal covenant is about you. You is the very purpose of what God has intended His will and His purpose for. And that's what the Bible tells us. Then in the second sermon, we look at the unfolding of the covenant and we learn it in the Garden of Eden. Now many people tell that there are many covenants. Well, we don't plan to argue with that. But we want to see that it is one covenant. It's like an agreement that we have made. Clause 1, clause 2, clause 3, clause 4. So we come to clause 1. It says down there, he said, you tell Adam and Eve that hey, you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
and you shall de- de- uh, die the day that you eat of it. You surely die. Now what is happening down there? We sometimes have to translate it a little bit backward. Before the foundation of the world, God already knew that when he created heaven and earth and created Adam and Eve and give them this commandment, they will surely fail. He already knew. So therefore God told Adam, or rather God told Jesus, this is what you have to do. So in the next clause that we find in um, the first three chapters of Genesis, after immediately after Adam and Eve fail or fall, God already announced what he already destined to do. Now we have to go back again afterward. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offering and her offering. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, God already knew that when Adam fall, it represents the whole mankind falling and that there will be a salvation, there will be a redemptive plan in order to rescue all those in which we read in Ephesians chapter 1 that we chose before the foundation of the world, predestined to the adoption of him, of, uh, to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So therefore God said, now what he's going to do is that all through history there will be enmity between you, Satan, and the seeds of the woman, between your offering and her offering. And finally, what you're going to do is that Jesus will have to come, and Jesus will bruise your head, and you shall only bruise his heel. Therefore, before the foundation of the world, how would he say something like this, that he chose you before the foundation of the world, that you should be holy and blameless to breast predestined you to the adoption of him as sons to Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. In other words, in order to choose choose you and save you, he already predestined that Jesus would have to die on the cross. It isn't something in which he comes to plan B or plan C. It's before the foundation of the world that sat down. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is what we have to do. If all, if we don't do all this, there is no chance of rescuing, no chance of redeeming the people in which we have chosen before the foundation of the world. Now you get the idea now? So now that we've learned, this is not just, just a section down in Hebrews or in Genesis, but right there in Ephesians, he already tells us very clearly. So therefore he tells us in, um, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, when they fall, this is what we're going to do. There will be enmity. And then we're going to find that when we read from Genesis right and Re- Revelation, Satan is always there in order to stop God's eternal plan of saving you and me. And we're going to account, we're going to see the diamond again, even right at the very time in which Jesus did come as a babe. Satan will still attempt in order to stop the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now we come to what we're going to look at the covenants going to be unfold to Abraham. But before that, there's another mention of covenants before Abraham. is the covenant unfold to Noah. Remember that everybody knows Noah right now, right? The ark. Everybody goes into the ark, and um, there was a big flood. And then after that, um, God says in Genesis chapter 9, verse 11, after the rain stopped, I establish my covenant with you, and never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now, we always teach it to our Sunday school, it's a rainbow right now. When, you, when God looks at the rainbow, God remembers his covenant. Not only the covenant of Noah, but the everlasting covenant. And likewise for us, when we see the rainbow, 
we will stop and pray. Lord, we thank you that you have made a promise before the foundation of the world. That before the foundation of the world, you have chosen me to be adopted as sons or daughters through Jesus Christ. Now, if there is no Jesus Christ or no Christ who come, everything will fall apart. There won't be salvation. Everything in God's redemptive plan must go as clockwork. Nothing must be left out. Not even a single person. And that is the eternal covenant that God has made before the foundation of the world. So when we look at the rainbow, always when we look at a rainbow, give thanks. Isn't it nice? Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the eternal covenant that I'm part of the covenant. That you've chosen me before the foundation of the world to be, a, to be adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. No Christ, no salvation, no redemption. So now we today look at the covenant unfolds to Abraham. Now the unfolding of the Abraham, uh, to Abraham actually started in, again in chapter 12 without the word covenant being mentioned. Look at what it says in verses 1 to 3 in Genesis. It said, And the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I'll bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless you, who bless those who bless you and him who dishonored you I will curse and in you the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now what do we find here in these three verses? Well, God made a covenant with Abraham. He didn't say a covenant. But again, the word will is what he will do. I will make you a great nation. That it is covenant. That it is promise. I will bless you. This promise, I will bless you. And then he said, I will bless those who bless you. I will, I will uh, curse those who dishonor you. And that brings you back to Genesis chapter 3 when she said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Anyone that is going to falter to prevent you from going forward, God said, I will curse. And that is what the Abrahamic uh, a covenant uh, we unfold before us. Now in Joshua, it's not on the screen, in Joshua chapter 24, 23, the Bible turned to be there. And he said, Joshua said to all the people, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your father lived beyond Ephraim, Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, they served other gods. And I took your, fa uh, took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offering many. And I gave him Isaac. So as we look at chapter 12, there are certain things that we need to, um, to illustrate what God intends for Abraham. The first thing is that go. Now Abraham and all those people with him are worshipping other gods. And they were in a pagan land. They were not worshipping the true God or the living God at that very moment. But God revealed to him. But God never tells us how he actually tells Abraham. But he tells tell Abraham, go, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, if you look at, at in chapter 11, they were actually in a place called Ur of the Chaldean, or today Babylon, or today's Iran formerly was Babylon. They were there. He said, go out from Ur and Chaldean. Go out from the world of idolatry and I will show myself to you. So the family, the whole family departed 
We see it the, at the end of chapter 11, verses 27 to the end. Go. You know, for Abraham to go, imagine that he is a pagan. He, he worshiping other gods. And suddenly, there's a, a revelation from God telling him, Abraham, Abraham, go. What do you make of that? You know, it's not like easy like as you go to the airport or somewhere, you go to the internet, then you can buy a ticket and you fly from here, right, to, to, to Bangkok. Go. How old was Abraham? It's not like, uh, like uh, he, he would be like uh, some of our marathon runners who will run uh, the, the 40 old kilometers a, uh, a day. He probably would have finished 10 kilos, 20 kilos, and the most, of, I think that would be also beyond him, and he had all the cattle with him, and all his people with him, and he go. From where he are in earth, he went up north, and then he, after that he would go down south to Egypt. It is almost close to a thousand kilometers. Go. And that's why God credited that to him as righteousness. Go. So he, he went all the way. And, and the, work met, the, the thing is that you go, I will show you where. It's not like, oh, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to Indonesia and in Jakarta. So you say, when you go down there, in French, I want to buy a ticket to go to Jakarta. Here, there's nothing wrong. God just tell Abraham, go. Abraham obeyed God. And God, he, he went. He took his family, he took his cattle, he took his donkey, everywhere, right? But it is a test of his test of his willingness to listen to God. And to, to, he, he gave a promise to, to him, I will make you a great nation. Can you imagine that Abraham 90 over years who said, Hey, promise something better la, rather than just make a nation work? I'm going to be a president of what? America or some, some big nation? He said, go, I will make you a nation. I will bless you. I bless you. I, I, I curse those who are against you. And then after that, he said, God, what's the purpose that in you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed? Think about it. But Abraham believed God. And Abraham did when? By faith. Therefore, in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. That's fun of it, isn't it? You know, knowing where. Remember, there's no map at that time, no ways right now. You, no, you got ways, so you don't know where to ways right now. Let's go. <clears throat> but at this point, where the point is, you to another thing that is very important is the genealogy. So before that we understand him better, we have to look at chapter 11, verse 27 onwards. In fact, it was not him. He, God told him, uh, Abraham that he had to go. But cannot go if the father won't go. But God didn't say he talked to, talk to Sarah, but Terah had a, had a vision that he should go, and he went. Right? So we learn from chapter 27, these are the generations of Terah, Terah father Abraham, Naho and Haran, and Haran father Lord, and all the families decided to go. Why? Because God made a promise. God made a covenant before the foundation of all, all these things must happen as it is. Nothing will stop it. And it includes a pagan or rather Abraham father, Terah said, hey, let's go. He followed. No need is actually to Abraham. Abraham said, you go. When the father said, someone, they say, Abraham, uh, let's make a journey. Oh, yeah, correct, correct. God already told me about it. And then they go. So the genealogy that we learn from here is that hey, it is from Terah and then to, to Abraham and then to Isaac. So that one turned us to another important genealogy, and that is found in Matthew. So you have the Bible, we have to meet me to Matthew Gospel. And when Matthew wrote start his, uh, his, um, his uh, Gospel, 
You start with a genealogy and you begin with Abraham. So we look at it, this is the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you bring it back right to the Garden of Eden when he said he will, he will hurt your heel, uh, head and then he will strike his heel. Abraham, all the way the reason behind Abraham is that it is going forward to Jesus Christ. So therefore we have the, we have the genealogy, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob and goes on as we go along. So there's another genealogy that is in Luke chapter 3. Now Luke chapter 3 is a reverse. But Luke chapter 3 tells us a little bit more that it includes in God's covenant. So in chapter, Luke chapter 3, and we find that um, at the end of it, right, we find that um, in verse 34, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, and so forth, and it ends up to be the son of God, the son of Adam, the son of God. So not being the foundation, before the foundation of the world, God already decreed that everything that is going to happen follow this genealogy. Not one person would be left. It includes. So therefore you look at yourself, it includes you. Remember the book of life? It includes you. Include all the people before you. God's purpose cannot be thwarted. So bring up to the next point, it is the history of the redemption. So what you see in the technology is the history of redemption from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and he goes forward, David, not missing one single person, because missing one, you would never have Jesus Christ. So biblical history, which begin with the book of Genesis and end with Revelation to the John, is actually the history of redemption. And you'll put it another way, it is how God has predestined or before the foundation have been covenant that this is the way it is going to happen in order to bring salvation to his people, the chosen people of God. Or you want to put it more personal? It is how God predestined or make it his purpose that this is the way it's going to happen in order to save you. So therefore, from Abraham to, uh, and, uh, um, to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He's the one who's going to be fulfilled in order the whole covenant to come into place. Without him, everything falls apart. That is his covenant. He came, he came to shed his blood. So therefore, in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to sprinkle blood that speak a better word than the blood of Abel. Or you want to put it another way, in Hebrew chapter 9, verse 22, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So therefore, Jesus had to come, Jesus come, not just to come only to have a vacation, but he came with a purpose. A purpose is to die, to pay for our sin. And therefore, it is the shedding of blood. If there is no shedding of blood, the sin in which Adam, in which he inherited, in which we continue to sin, would have no chance. It is in Christ Jesus that we would have the forgiveness of sin. In him, we have redemption through his blood, in Ephesians chapter 7, 11, verse 7, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So therefore the covenant unfold to Abraham, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, point back to the Garden of Eden, and then it points back, forward, until the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he bare the cross to die on Golgotha. Now, in verse 3, now the Lord, the Lord said to Abraham, <clears throat> it says that we just learned, 
Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go! And, and Abraham go. But let us look at what is the key or what is the content of the covenant. Three things. First is make you a great nation. Abraham, wow, where is the great nation? Standing now, you would actually understood that, that hey, there's the nation of Israel. And there is a big, ch uh, there is this uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. By that time, did he know? Hey, he knew. Bless you, to have you. and you get a great name. But he actually bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the name comes to Christ. So blessing and cursing, and that is what um, God intend him to do. And then in Genesis chapter 15, so we have Genesis chapter 12, God renew or God added more, God revealed another clause in the covenant. Another part of the covenant, the everlasting covenant. In that you say, on that day, the Lord in chapter 15 verse 17 to 18, you say, on that day, the Lord made a covenant Abraham, saying, to your offering I'll give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Ephraim. So now that God renewed the covenant, this time with a, a, with a sign. But now he's telling more specific, there will be a piece of land, there will, there will be a piece of rare estate. And then you find that in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham said, how, how would I know? So we have... Um, he tell Abraham, then you're going to cut the animals into two and place it down there. And I put a fire, a, fi a firing pot that goes across it and to burn it. And this is God's signature. It, it, it is God telling him, this is what I'm going to do. Abraham. So the, I, the covenant unfolds further in chapter 17. He said, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offering after you through their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offering after you. And I'll give to you and your offering after you the land, your sojourn, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be your God. So now that it is unfolding, remember so now you, 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 you get used to the word unfolding or people like to say they are, they are revealing uh, gradually. So God is actually now showing Abraham that ah, but still then if you put your shoe in the Abraham, oh, ah, God's given me some great covenant in which how, how am I going to know all this thing? And then in the middle of all this, he said, hey, you know, the, 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 when I give the covenant to you, there is covenant obligation. Just like us, that we are part, chosen people of God, we have obligation. And God said, before he can do anything, before he, he also see the lands, God said, hey, this is what you need to do. In 17, 19, verse 2, 10, he said, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my commandment, you and your offering after you throughout, uh, throughout their generation. This is my covenant you shall keep between me and your offering after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. But God gave the covenant to him, he said, but there is no air yet. How? How? I'm already old, Sarah is old. And then he tells him in chapter 17, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. We are showing Abraham this. Not knowing yet, ma, right now. Everything is not concrete. It's just like an agreement put down there. I will establish my covenant with Isaac. Whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. But what did the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us simply this. What is the implication? It's simply this. Abraham believed God. 
Now you put it in our context. In Abraham's case, he don't have the Bible, you know. Could it not? There's no Bible there. God appealed to him, or God, I don't read the Bible, never tells us. But we have the whole Bible with us. We believe God. We believe that all that we have read so far through those verses that we learned from the last three sermons. But when Abraham believed God, it was counted as righteousness. It was counted as righteousness in Romans chapter 4 verse 3. And what the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. Now we have to put ourselves in shoes in, in, in Abraham's shoes. Nothing at all. Not like we have the 66 books of Bible. He tell him, hey, you, you know, you go from your place down there, you move north, right? Then after that, he shows that ah, this is the real estate I'm going to give to you. And your offering, wow. God, are you joking? No, I don't even have an heir. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, the Bible tells us something very interesting about Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, 9, 8 to 9, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentile by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now the Bible tells us that God already preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Now, I was searching all over the Bible. When, when did we have a gospel rally in uh, Abraham's time? Right now? When did a preacher come over there to preach the gospel to Abraham? But the Bible just says that God just tells us that after, and the Bible foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before to Abraham. This we have to turn to Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> it says then, let me read. The other six verses very important. And I believe this is the gospel. He said, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. It's not like a preacher preaching to Abraham. It is God. Fear not, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. And Abraham said, Oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Elisha of uh, Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you, are, you have given me no offering, and a member of my household will be heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. You are able to number them. Then he said, so shall your offering be. And he believed God and counted to him as righteousness. So what happened at that time, moment time? He went to the night sky. But at that time, not like us. You look at a night sky in Kuala Lumpur, you don't see anything right now. Right? Only the astro, the astro satellite down there only. But at that time, uh, you have to, if you go to, say, a place, a high place like Genting Island, that night, you see more stars. You go to, for example, you, have anyone climbed Mount Kinabalu before? All right, or, yeah, you, you like, the, the stars are very near, and you won't get touched, like you can touch the, the, the stars. So Abraham was shown this, you look at the stars down there, wow. So many stars on it. More stars than you got the, the, the sky. There's no pollution right now. He says, right then, hey, look, so shall your offering be. So many. 
and he believed the Lord, and he, shall, he counted it to him as righteousness. That's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Christ. Look at Jesus for your salvation. And so, so, so when you look at that, and therefore, the Bible says, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. In you shall all nations be blessed. When you look at the stars, not knowing anything yet right now, not everything sure, but it is, and God counted it as righteousness right now. In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said that in chapter John chapter 5, chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. There was a man here before anything that's going to happen. He had, there is no David, there is no all these prophets. Hey, he saw the days of Jesus Christ. God revealed it to him. That's the gospel. And all those, the stars down there, one of them is Mira. I know one of them also, Eula, right now. All these things that, hey, these people are going to be the great nation and they're going to belong to me. They're chosen before the foundation of the world. It's also shown to Abraham. Right? So your father rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. He knew at that very moment in time, I'm going to see next week when we, when we look at the, um, the, the, the covenant uh, revealed to Isaac. He knew Abraham somehow God already showed it to him. He saw it and he was glad. So he said the covenant we have to make up our mind. So therefore the next thing we're going to look about covenant is that we want to look at the air of the covenant. So therefore we turn again to Galatians. Turn with me to Galatians chapter um, chapter Chapter 4. And this one will confirm to you, you are going to be indeed the chosen people of God. One or the other. So in Galatians chapter 4, verse 24, 26, say, all right, better listen to everything. He said, uh, Galatians chapter 4, we have the Bible with you. He said, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. And the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh. The son of the free woman was born through promise, through covenant. And this may be interpreted allegorically. This woman are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, and she is slavery with her children. But Jerusalem above is free, and she is your mother. For his region rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear, break forth, and cry aloud. You who are not in labor, for the ch children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who, was, uh, who has a husband. 28. Now you, brother, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him, who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. So what does scripture say? Cast out the say, slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit the son of the free woman. So, brother, we are not children of slave, but of the free woman. So, which one are you? The son or daughter of the free woman or the slave? The other thing that we read in chapter 28, uh, verse 28, Now you, brother, like ex Isaac, are children of promise. So when Abraham looked at the 
night sky. I mean, you look at all the stars there. What do you see? All the children of promise, not the children of slavery. All the children of promise. All the children of covenant. God has promised before the foundation of the world, chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined. And those are the children of promise. So therefore, if you are in Christ, you're not the children of the slavery. You are children of the promise. Now you see that? So therefore, all the things that happened before the foundation in which God with the Trinity, we all decided that these are the things that we're going to do belongs to you. You are the children of promise in which he promised to Abraham is the same promise that you inherited because you are the children of promise. You are children of the faith, just like Abraham. So today, you don't only call yourself a Christian, I am a children of the promise. You got a lot of difference. But it is always there. But my pastor, why is this not being taught? We go to that when we come to application. Two covenants, one saving and the other not. Very clear. One can save, one cannot save. One that is in the promise, one is not in the promise. Either you are born of the promise or outside the promise. Free of flesh. And therefore the flesh always want to persecute the free. And you're going to see that, if you go back to read Genesis, right? There is always the tension between Haggai and, and the, the other wife of Abraham. Always there's a tension. And until today, there is still a tension. So, if you are in Christ, you are the children of the covenant. You are children of the promise of God in which we learned in Ephesians, you are chosen before the foundation of the world. Right? <clears throat> Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God already disdained, uh, predestined. God already wanted to make sure. But it doesn't say down there, we're going to condition down there for you to do it. God will do it for you. That he should choose you to be holy and blameless. Before the foundation of what is already set aside, man. Not something in which you're going to say, ah, this is going to happen. Ah, this is, this is, this. But there is a sign in which we are. He predestined us to be adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So now it's what we're listening to, right? That's the covenant of God, right now. So where are we now? We are now at the heir of the covenant. So we, we find that in Galatians. But the heart of the covenant, what is the heart of the covenant of God? What did God actually say? And he actually did say to you, he catch the thing to, when he said to Abraham, I wish I will be your God. Not you say it, not. he said, God said, I will be your God. And then what did you say to Abraham earlier on, right? Go back and check which words there is. So now we come to all this, I will be your God. And that is the heart of the covenant of God. I will be your God. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 7. He said, I will take you to be my people, God said. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out of under the burden of the Egyptian. That's the covenant. I will be your God. Everything is settled. No need anything else. Then. God say no before the foundation of the world, chose you. I will be your God. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 26, verse 12. I will walk among you and will be your God. And then add one more thing. You shall be my people. No condition. Huh? Then he tells us in Jeremiah, 
by this command, and you're going to see this in the whole of Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah, you'll find this. And by this command, I gave you, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Walk in the way that I command you, it may be well with you. And later on in chapter 31, verse 32, say, I will put the good law into your heart, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's what God says. And then this implies that God will be with us, as he was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many others. God is committed to us, and in response, he called us for our trust and obedience. In other words, God didn't say, I accept you now. God said, I accept you before the foundation of the world. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. On that day, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 8, on that day, God made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your offering, I will give that this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of Ephraim. So as we look at it, <clears throat> God continued to renew his covenant with us. So we call it unfolding. People call it differently. We call it unfolding. It's the unfolding of blanket or unfolding something. And then you unfold it and it shows greater as it goes along. But there are signs of the covenant. So then the sign of covenant, right, in Genesis chapter 17, God gave some sign to Abraham. One of the signs to your offering, uh, or to his sign, is that you, um, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9 to 10, and God said to Abraham, as, you have, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offering after you throughout their generation. This is the, my covenant which you shall keep between me and your offering after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So now what God gave the sign of circumcision to Abraham. But to us who are chosen people in the New Testament, we are we also have a sign, the sign of baptism. The sign when we come together, we celebrate the Holy Communion is a sign to us. Okay, we will draw to the close. What how are we to apply that all? that we have learned. In short, there's a few things, or quite a lot of things. Question we ask, are you a child, a child of promise? Are you a child of promise, or are you a, a child of slavery? Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, we have learned. And this is what God uh, um, um, a um, uh, promise to us in Galatians chapter 3 turn with me I just add this in Galatians chapter 3 some of you have Bible with you just listen to the Bible if you do not have <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 Now, the promise was made to Abraham and to his offering. It shall not say, and of the brethren, uh, of, and to the offering, refer to many, but referring to one, and your offering, who is Christ. Now, Paul replied, when, when Abraham was given the promise, it was promised to one offering, and that is Jesus Christ. So in Christ alone, because through Christ, all of us are part of the body of Christ. We are in Christ. We are the offering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, through his offering, we granted that they are all children of the promise. So that the covenant promise that we've given to us 
in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 33. And this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it on their heart, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So therefore we ask ourselves one simple question. That we have learned from the Bible that there is such a thing. For example, in Galatians, tell us very clearly, either you are a children of promise or you are a children of slave. But if you are the children of promise, then you are chosen before the foundation of the world. You are children of the covenant. So therefore, our conclusion is this. God in the Bible deal with us covenantally. God deal with us with covenant promise. I remember people saying, I don't want to. The Bible is also very clear. There is such a thing as children of promise and a children of slave. Which one are you? Choose. If you are children of promise, you can be sure that you are chosen before the foundation of the world. And you are people of the covenant of God. Now for some of you who are younger, which the Bible tells us your simple, that not only you are a Christian that you believe in Jesus Christ, but you are also a children of promise. God promised that you will be his people and God said, I will be your God. Now every night when you go to sleep or before you wake up, you say, we thank you, Lord, that you are my God. You say you are my God and you say that I am your people. That make all the difference in your Christian life. Now, why is all this thing? Uh, why, why churches do not believe in this anymore? Maybe it is unbelief or wrong belief. And therefore, we look at the five children that uh, we have before us. Remember the last time when we talked about the first sermon that, A, hey, because we are Calvinists, we are Reformed, and we certainly believe in un total depravity, unconditional election. Limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Why? Basically, if you are a children of promise, it is before the foundation of the world. And God chose you, not knowing what you are doing or what have you done. It is unconditional election. And because after Adam 4, you are totally depraved. You can't make the decision on this. God said, I will do, I will save you, and he is irresistible. And for us, we believe that it is limited atonement because, hey, God chosen, God, God didn't choose everybody. God chose a limited. And even though there are so many stars in the heaven, it is still a limit. There are no more. And then because he is your God, he persevered you until the end. So persevering of the saints. It stands all together. You take one out, the rest fall. Why? Because we are the chosen people of God. In which God said, I will be your God. Let me say, when God said before the foundation, of said, I will be your God, wherever you are, God will seek you out. That's what the Bible says. Even though you may be in such a terrible, God said, when I speak to you, when I take you back, it is irresistible, irresistible. You will be my child. And I will make sure that you will persevere until the end. So the third thing that we're going to do in the application is very simple. Worship. Keep commandment. Obey God. We are covenant children of God. And the beautiful thing about all this is that God is going to work in your life. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. So therefore you have to come before God, Lord, I thank you that I'm your child. I want to be your child. Right? I want to be able to keep commandment and obey you. The third thing, the fourth thing that we're going to we are fellowshipping with the covenant God. 
God said, I will be your God. And we may not be like Abraham, in which God actually must have shown him the direction, somehow or other, this is the way to go, this is the way to go, and God, Abraham moved. But we don't have, this is the way to go, we have the Bible. Every time we open the Bible, we fellowship with the covenant God. I will be your God, you will be my people. Is it true? Then the truth first thing that we have to serve the living God. He, he is our God. And he has a purpose for us. And therefore we have to ask him, God, what do you want me to do? How do we serve you? And the third, sixth thing that we, we do is a read. Reading. Always bear in mind the history of redemption, the history of unfolding covenantal story history in the Bible. So when we look at the Bible, it's unfolding. Don't you think it's interesting? Read it many times, but still interesting to me. For you, you, maybe you have never seen the covenant history. Wow, now you see everything as it unfolds before you. We only started with the creation until then we have Garden Eden, Eden, and then we have Abraham. And it's getting more interesting. What are you going to happen in Isaac? What are you going to happen in Jacob? What are you going to be happening in Joseph? It is unfolding. And so therefore, when you look at the Bible, the Bible is about the history of redemption, how God moved about in history in order to bring about the Lord Jesus Christ, and finally he died on the cross and he was resurrected. Not one step must go further or else we would have no salvation. That's history. And when you look at the Bible in that manner, then you find that you pick up anywhere in the Bible, you see the history of redemption. And you're going to learn that and apply this in the Bible, and you find the, the Bible very interesting. The seventh thing that we're going to do is look at the, look at the night sky. Maybe not here, lah. next time you go on holiday, Somewhere in near the sea or up in the mountain, look at the night sky. Somewhere there is a star that bears your name. Abraham saw it. But Abraham cannot be like name everybody there, right? Now. But one of the stars is you. Now, why you not look at the night sky? Abraham saw the night sky and he saw all his descendants. Now you look at the night sky and you see your own descendants. Not Abraham's descendant, plus your own descendant. So therefore, everything that you do in your life must be able to bear when you look at the night sky, your descendants are there. Young man, when you look for a wife, look for a covenant wife. Ladies, look for covenant men who read the Bible. Because once you come together, you see your descendants unfolding just like Abraham and Sarah. So therefore, we are in a big, important mission of God. And that is his purpose. Not in the purpose of Abraham, but the purpose of every one of us. We look at the night sky. Then you say, why? <clears throat> you say that in Philippians chapter 12, chapter 2, verse 12 and 9, and we draw to a close. He said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his own good pleasure. So if you are a child of the promise, if you are a child of the covenant of God, you are God's people, the Bible says God is working in your life. 
Not for your own purpose, you know. You look really carefully. Go to will and to work for his good pleasure is for his, not your good pleasure. So we are serving a living God. We are serving a covenant God. And therefore knowing that you are indeed the chosen people of God. Make sure that everything you do do it for his own good pleasure, not yours. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we want to thank you for this morning that you unfold before us again, O oh Lord, the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for the living word of God. Without the living word, O oh Lord, how would we know you? And it is, Lord, to the word of God the Lord, you have revealed to us that you are indeed a God who have chosen us before the foundation of the world. You predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. And therefore, Lord, reveal to us, Lord, show us through the Bible, show us to people around us that, Lord, you are working in us both to will and to work for your own good pleasure, not ours. For we are bought with a price and we belong to you. For we are the children of promise. For all this we give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>